What's up everybody, I'm back, and I am here with a super light video, I am sorry about that, but now it's here, and I think I have some things that no one else really touched on, so let's get into it. Kong Skull Island Trailer 2, Things You Missed. So the trailer starts off with an old projector flashing images of shaky studio logos to hammer on the point that the movie takes place in the past. Modern technology does not exist. This, as well as the inclusion of the song Bad Moon Rising, a song about trouble in the near future, the same thing that our characters are about to experience, is a very good way to set the feel for this period piece. So missable detail number one, Skull Island resembles a skull. The next thing you may have missed, and the next thing that I wanted to talk about, was the fact that the plan to use explosives to map the island doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Purely from a seismology standpoint, this does make sense, assuming the island has already been scouted and meters have been placed all throughout the island. This is clearly not the case. This is most likely a cover plan to unearth the monsters, get them riled up and out in the open, and that way our main characters who are being sent in there don't have any idea. Now this was most likely put in effect by John Goodman's character, who we see knows a lot about the giant monsters, uh, he even has the quote, The place where myth and science meet. So he clearly knows about the Mutos on the island before he makes landfall. This is most likely implying that he is part of Monarch, the team from Godzilla 2014 in charge of studying Kaiju. In the prequel comic, Godzilla Awakening, Monarch has already been founded before the year 1954, so it would make sense that it would be operating and searching for monsters in the 70s. Chapman, the person who asks, Is that a monkey? is played by Toby Kibble or Koba from Planet of the Apes. Another notable thing about Planet of the Apes is that Terry Nortray, someone responsible for motion capture in the Planet of the Apes films, is responsible for portraying Kong in this film. Nortray on IMDb is listed as the most experienced ape actor in Hollywood and the second most notable motion capture actor ever right after 2005's King Kong, Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis is also responsible for bringing to light Caesar in Dawn Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Now the cinematography in this movie appears to be on the same level as Shin Gojira, the most visually stunning Godzilla movie ever. This is seen from this amazing shot of the camera panning through the cockpit of a helicopter while Kong is moving around and roaring on the outside. It's important to note here that Sam Jackson's character, Cornell Packard, is already stepping into action as a first response, whereas other characters are looking in shock. This is done as a little character trait to show how hardened and experienced he is as a lieutenant. Now this whole scene is what looks like our introduction to Kong in the movie. It is important to note that even though Kong is menacing to the soldiers, he is still adolescent, meaning he will grow in height and age before 2020 when he eventually matches up against Godzilla. It makes sense because now he's 100 feet, whereas Godzilla is 300 plus feet. It would also make sense for him to grow and age due to the fact that that is a 50 year difference between 1970 and 2020. Another amazing shot in this trailer is when Kong is throwing the helicopter we see him grab in trailer 1 into the ground, we really see how dynamic this movie is going to be. We see Kong's fur blowing in the wind, scratches on his body, already setting up the fact that he is a rivaled king of the island, and helicopters flying above him. All this layering really helps to set this movie apart from some more standard action films. Now this shot of Sam Jackson looking at Kong shows how much of a badass his character is going to be. At the same time, it's a cool double reference to King Kong 2005 and King Kong 1976. We see that multiple pilots have died from the attack from Kong. Notice their helmets are reminiscent of Mogera's pilots from Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. Notice how John Goodman tells Sam Jackson, Get us home with proof. Monsters exist. As we know in Godzilla 2014, the public doesn't quite know about giant monsters up until Godzilla and the Muto's attack. That means that these characters don't make it home with proof. This is a topic for a future video, but I want to pitch the idea now that Skull Island might have a cast of expendable characters, a suicide squad. It wouldn't be out of the realm for Gareth Edwards' movie universe to kill off all the main characters in his film. Here's a look at our character Sam, played by actress Tina Jing, who is an up-and-coming star leading in movies such as The Great Wall and the upcoming and highly anticipated, in my case, Pacific Rim Uprising or Pacific Rim 2. Now we get a look at our natives of the island, who are not like any other natives we've seen since 1933's King Kong. They're dressed in very little clothes, with crazy paint all over them. This is not like the natives we've seen in any other film since. Notice the interesting patterns of paint on their body and how it matches the ruins behind them. We are introduced to John C. Riley's character, who little is known about. 
there are quite a few missable details here, so pay attention closely. If you really look at Riley's clothes and facial hair, it is apparent he has been stranded on Skull Island for a while. Notice how his clothes are similar to World War II pilots, his hat and badge as well as his jacket. If you look closely, you can make out the words 2151 Fighter GP on his back. One last thing to mention about his appearance here is the inclusion of the phrase good for your health on the back of his jacket, being a reference to the popular sketch character Dr. Steve Brule. For your health. 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 The natives and Riley appear to have moved into a crashed bow of some sort. You can tell, you can see that it's a large metal structure shaped like the inside of a hollowed out ship. So this might be what Riley was on when he got stranded on Skull Island somehow. There are many shrines on this boat being dedicated to Kong, meaning that both the boat and Kong must have been around for a while. Notice how the camera has to line up here to create the picture of Kong. Showing this impressive angle works similar to the cinematography, not being filmed straight in a standard way, but in a more intricate way. We hear Kong is a good king who keeps to himself unless provoked, similar to how King Kong in 1933 as well as in 2005 acted. It's cool to note here that they refer to Kong as the King, setting up for the King Kong title. One last thing is that they say he doesn't attack unless provoked. Then they go on to say that Kong was provoked by the helicopters dropping bombs on his island. The shot of Kong walking through the water is impressive for many reasons. Not only does it look amazing, but it's also impressive to note that the CG on the water is absolutely astounding. Doing CG with water is one of the hardest things to do. The level of realism here is also important to note, because you can see mist from the water being splashed through the air, and you can see Kong isn't just clean and normal, he is all dirty because he lived on this island for so long. The shot of Kong standing in front of a rising sun, as well as many other shots from the first trailer, work to give this movie an Apocalypse Now feel. This is appropriate due to the wartime era this movie is set in. Notice how the cave the skull crawlers come from matches the same color scheme as the Mutos from last movie. These dead Kong skeletons are so big that our characters have to maneuver their way through them. They are much bigger than the living Kong in this movie, which also suggests Kong growing in size before he fights Godzilla. Look how they died holding hands. This suggests that they are smart creatures and they have emotions and feelings. They could be Kong's direct family, just a theory. This also helps to support my multiple Kongs theory that there will be multiple Kongs in this movie. Look how the skull crawler glows as it runs. Possibly, they have an EMP attack similar to the Mutos in order to defend against beams such as Godzilla's atomic breath. The design of the skull crawler is very similar to some fan concept art that was made for Rodan for the legendary Godzilla sequels. It isn't unheard of for a studio to listen to their fans in this way and influence their decisions based off what their fans want. This boneyard is a large action sequence that we've seen pieces from from the first two trailers. This is how it will most likely play out on screen. <laughs> This shot of Kong looking at Brie Larson, aka Weaver, and Tom Hiddleston's character, James Conrad, is a very close behavior trait demonstrated by all Kongs in previous King Kong movies. It's a nice easter egg to see some of those traits brought into this movie. Not much to say about this buffalo here, but it looks pretty cool. Now we are introduced to what could possibly be the monster in the quote unquote boss fight at the end of this movie. The massive skull crawler is mo- The massive skull crawler most likely works the same way the Queen Alien works in the Alien series. This nighttime fire sequence is something that we've also seen played out for the first two trailers. Here's how I believe it will most likely go down. how Kong can stand unaffected by the fire. This is setting up his resistance to Godzilla's atomic breath. It looks like the soldiers from the first trailer are going to wind up noticing this giant spider and start fighting it. This could be done the same way that the Triceratops fight in King Kong 33 was handled, just a way to showcase the danger of Skull Island. It could also be a nice easter egg to Kamunga from Toho's Godzilla series. But look how it's shot from a first person perspective. This is an interesting way to show a kaiju fight. It also reminds me a lot of the spider boss fight from Black Ops 3. Look here how John C. Riley has new clothes, a fresh shave, and a small katana. This suggests that a lot of time has passed. The clothes as well as the katana look like they could have belonged to a Japanese soldier in World War II. 
Maybe he got stranded here as a war captive. This scene looks like a real hero moment for him. And with the possible foreshadowing at the end of the trailer, We're all gonna die together out here. <laughs> he shouldn't have come here. I think this skull crawler attack in the Green Fog Boneyard may be where he, as well as some other characters such as John Goodman, may die. This is because we don't see anything else in the trailers to suggest they make it past this point. It is clear that this man is about to sacrifice himself with the grenades. We see him pull the pins and walk up to the skull crawler in a Jesus-like pose. We also see shots of people crying shortly afterward, which suggests that he does take his life right here. There's a pretty cool shot of Kong stepping behind two running soldiers. Maybe these are the two soldiers whose helmets we see earlier in the trailer. There's some sort of stick monster bug that is not Mothra. It doesn't look like Mothra, and there's nothing to suggest that it would be. Keep in mind that this is a King Kong movie, and although it shares a universe with Godzilla, it is not going to be a Godzilla movie. Although I do think they need to set Mothra up beforehand, I think she deserves her own movie. I don't think that they're going to throw away the larva into this movie as a throwaway character. The trailer ends with this epic shot of Kong beating his chest and roaring into the camera. This is an awesome moment for King Kong that is a trait that he shares with all previous incarnations. We end with a little joke from John C. Riley, which is great, because one of the things that Godzilla 2014 lacked was a comic relief. This will help the viewer to feel entertained throughout the movie. I think that it's a good inclusion to have more comic relief in these movies to make these movies more mainstream. One thing that I think this movie really needs is to reach out to general audiences, unlike Godzilla 2014 was able to do. Kong Skull Island has a lot of potential, and it's going to be an amazing movie, or at least it looks like it so far. I hope it will live up to the hype. I'm certainly excited. Thank you guys all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. D-Man.